All right, so um, you know this series has been a lot of fun, and it's really kind of highlighted the the one of the realities of being a pastor is. You just have to deal with a lot of questions. I mean, I get a lot of questions in this series. I've gotten a lot of questions. Um, and some of them are, are significant. Some of them are silly. Uh, but I do my best to answer any, in as many questions as I can. Um, here's some questions I've actually been asked. And so maybe this is your question. I can just answer it for you. Um, is God a football fan? Um, in the Old Testament, no, because of the pigskin. In the New Testament, yes, yes, he's a football fan, but not soccer. He's an American football fan, okay? Um, here's the second one. Uh, do all dogs go to heaven? Um, yes, all dogs do go to heaven. No cats. Okay, there we go. Uh, number three, who's to blame for the original sin, Adam or Eve? Um, I think the scriptures are pretty clear on this. But considering how many ladies I see and how many I live with, I'm going to say the snake. Okay, next question. Uh, number four, how does Jesus feel about Cubs fans? He is a friend of sinners. All right, there we go. So um, there you go. Listen, this series has been a lot of fun, but it's also brought up a ton of questions. Namely, are we living in the last days? Like, is this the end? And, um, and unfortunately, what I've discovered is most followers of Jesus cannot actually answer that. They don't know. Um, as a matter of fact, I read recently that um, scripture has five times more to say about Jesus's second coming than his first. Yet the average believer knows five times more about his first coming than his second. And so I've just been trying to close the gap and help you understand to answer your questions about the closing of this age and the opening of eternity, okay? Today, I'm gonna tackle a, a topic that's got a ton of questions associated with it. I wanna talk to you today about something called the rapture, the rapture. Um, maybe you've heard of it, maybe not, but I wanna start with a basic definition. Um, the rapture is a supernatural event that will remove the church or the followers of Jesus from the earth to be with Christ as eternity continues to march on in the end times plans. So it's a supernatural event where the church, the followers of Jesus are removed. They're to be with Jesus so that the earth can continue to go through the end times markers or the end times events that God's laid out for it. Um, now, I, I wanna say up front, this is a very, very criticized um, kind of idea. Not everybody agries on this. And, and, and in an end times um, kind of teaching, here's what you have to do. We have to be open-handed with some things. There's some, some imagery, some uh, understanding that often we lack. And so um, anybody that tells you they got it all figured out, they ain't got it all figured out, um, including me. But I want to present to you today kind of what I do believe about this, this thing called the rapture. And I want to try to address some of the criticisms around it. Namely, right out of the gate, one of the critics of the rapture would say um, the word rapture doesn't even appear in scripture. You can't find that word, which is true. You cannot find the word rapture in scripture. You can also not find the word Bible in scripture. Yet it doesn't mean there's not a Bible, okay? So here's what I hope to show you is that the concept's there, even though the word's not, okay? And um, the word rapture or the concept where they get it from comes from a Greek word called haparazo. And, um, and, and what it means is to be snatched away, to be taken quickly, to be caught away. Um, so, so it's this idea of quickly something is taken away or removed. And um, you can see the concept throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. For example, in the Old Testament, there's a guy named Enoch who was walking. And then all of a sudden, the Bible says he was snatched away and taken to heaven. There's also um, uh, in the Old Testament, a prophet named Elijah. And the Bible says that he was walking with his understudy. And all of a sudden, he was snatched away um, in a chariot of fire taken to heaven. Um, in the New Testament, there was an evangelist named Philip who just got done sharing the fa his faith with someone, and the Bible says he was snatched away, and instead of going to heaven, he was put on another place in the earth, just like a teleportation almost kind of idea. And, and this is the same idea that the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians and says, hey, um, every believer who's alive when Christ decides will experience this taken away, this snatching, this rapturing. And, um, and he tells about it in 1 Thessalonians 4, 
He says, we tell you this directly from the Lord. So Paul's saying, this ain't my opinion. This is what I believe the Holy Spirit is writing right now. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, first the believers who have died. So it basically said those who have died are going to see Jesus first. We're not going to beat them to the, to the finish line. But then what he, notice what he says next. He says they're going to rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up. That, that's that word, taken, snatched quickly, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. And he says, this message should encourage you and to encourage each other with it. Now, now, let me just give you a couple facts of what he's describing. First, he is saying, hey, the rapture means there will be a group of people who do not experience death. Okay, so most people go into eternity through the door of death. He says, if, the, if you happen to be alive when the rapture takes place, there will be a quick snatching and and." You're going to see Jesus, but you will not have to go through the coffin to get there. Okay. Second thing he tells us is this will be instantaneous. Um, in first Corinthians 15, it says that it will be in the twinkling of an eye. Okay. So, so measuring like, like your eye blinking, um, is one, one thousandth of a second. So, 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 so like the one, one thousand to one thousand in that little space I just gave you. One one thousandth of that, that's how quick, like, like instant. You be, you be sitting beside somebody, gone. Um, it also says that the minute it happens, they'll be transfer, it's going to be transformational, um, meaning that um, you're going to be instantly changed. Like in that instant, um, age is just going to melt away. Uh, disability just going to dissolve. Like sorrow going to be replaced with joy. Imperfection is immediately becomes perfection. You will become as you will be in eternity. It's just, I mean, quick is that you'll be made perfect. Okay. But the last thing that, that it's pointing out is this is a rescue mission. That that's the theory behind it. This is a rescue mission. So what do I need to be rescued from? Well, the wrath that's to come. Okay. So, so let me say it this way. Um, the rapture removes the church, which then allows for the Antichrist to move into his place. Okay? The Antichrist is a charismatic, capable leader who will step on the scene and cause the world to come under his agenda, and he will lead the world in a godless direction. When he appears, Scripture tells us that it will begin a period of time called the tribulation, the tribulation is a seven year period where basically the antichrist is going to cause the world, they're going to deceive the world into following a godless path. And, and it's going to get bad for Christians. As a matter of fact, scripture tells us we'll be persecuted. If you you're here during the, the tribulation, that you'll be abused. You may not be able to buy or sell anything that, that it's, it's going to be a bad season. And, and because he's leading them in this godless direction, the book of revelation says God will begin to pour out specific judgments on the earth, like plagues and, and, and famine and, and certain disease. I mean, it's going to get bad. Let me, let me say it this way, just to sum it up. You can read it all in revelation, but, um, if you are alive during the tribulation, it will be the most brutal time in human history, the most brutal time in human history, unquestionable. Okay. Now, so that's the reason it's a rest. The rapture is a rescue mission. And to show us what he means by rescue mission, Jesus connects the rapture to, to Old Testament stories that had rescue missions. You can find it in Luke 17. This is Jesus speaking of, of the rapture and tying it to, giving us an, an idea of um, how this has happened in the past, maybe in just a single life. He says, just as it was in the days of Noah, Noah's an Old Testament um, figure. He says, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up till the day Noah entered the ark. So um, he, he basically says, it's just life as usual, normal. Just, it, it, was just, it was typical. No, nobody saw it coming. It just One day, it started to rain, and Noah and his family went into the ark. Now look, it says, then the flood came and destroyed them all. And then he says, it was also that way in the days of Lot. Lot was an Old Testament account, and, and he lived in a city called Sodom and Gomorrah, and here's what it says. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. 
And he says, but the day Lot left the city, Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed everybody in it. And it will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Then he goes on to say, on that day, no one who is on the housetop with possessions inside should go back down to get them. Here's what he's saying. Hey, don't, don't be worried about what life here's got going on. You're, you're focused on eternity. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. So here's what happened. Lot was warned judgment was coming. He and his family were allowed to leave because they followed God. They're leaving, but his wife kept longing for what she was leaving. And she kept looking back. And the Bible says that in judgment of her looking back and not trusting God, she became a pillar of salt. Like, like she's salty. Okay. And she just, um, and whoever tries to keep their life will lose it. And whoever keeps their life will preserve it. I think it's funny. It says preserve it because she became a salt anyways. Um, and it says, I tell you on that night, two people will be in one bed and one will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding grain together. One will be taken and the other left. Um, and so, so this is a pretty stark picture Jesus um, shows us. And he doesn't pick these two Old Testament passages as random. He picks them uniquely because they match up. And I believe they match the culture of the end, of the end times generation. So, so, so they give us a picture of what it looks like to be raptured and the type of culture that Jesus is going to conduct this event in. Um, first of all, um, it's a corrupt culture they're in. You can go read a lot of the Old Testament, you're gonna see some crazy stuff, but you will not find a time that's more violent, more impure, more godless than when Noah was alive and Lot was alive. We're talking about entertainment, debauchery, sexuality, um, uh, godlessness, no fear of God, no decency. I mean, it is unbelievable the things that happen. And I'm going to talk a little bit about it next week, but listen, it looks a whole lot like what we see today. Like I think Noah and Lot were watching the news going to have people lost their minds, just like some of us are. Okay. So, so it's a corrupt culture. And the next it's a coming judgment, which means they're warned a judgments is coming. In Noah's case, God's going to send a flood. In Lot's case, he's going to send fire. Um, and, and, and in our case, we know that there's going to be a judgment. That God is not just slow or in, 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 not, he's not paying attention. He's waiting for people to turn to him. But when he decides he's going to come and all this sin, sinfulness that we see for, for ages that we've seen, it's going to be judged. But listen, God is just which means no violation of his law will go unaddressed. And so, so we, uh, there's a coming judgment for the world, for all of us. And then it says this, that it was a certain day they were removed. So I think this is important. It doesn't say that they went through a season or it was a, a general amount of time. He's saying there was a day the door on the ark shut and judgment started. There was a day that Lot left and judgment started. So it's a specific moment on the calendar. And here's what I'll tell you. From my studies, the rapture is going to be a specific day that will be undeniable in history. It'll be clearly seen what's taking place. It ain't going to be like a season. It's going to be clear. And Jesus so says this. Notice what he said. He said, there'll be some people who are in bed at night and some people who are in the field at day. You know what he's saying? That when I come back, half the earth will be sleeping and half the earth will be awake because I'm coming on a specific day and it will affect those different places on the world differently in the time that I come. And then the last thing is, in their story is they're carried above it. So there's a coming judgment, but because of God's faithfulness to them, they're carried above it. The Bible says that, that um, the ark rose above the waters and it says that Lot and his family went into the mountains above the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, guess what we're promised? We're not promised to hunker down through it. Scripture tells us we'll be called into the air above what happens on the earth. So it's a, it's a, it's a picture, and, and it's, it's literally the central motivation is this rescuing. It, the reason that, that Jesus points to Noah and Lot is because it's a picture of the rapture. It unpacks. Now, now let me say this, this, this. That's why in Revelation chapter 4, if you read the book of Revelation, here's what you're going to notice. Chapter 1, it talks about the church. Chapter 2, it talks about the church. Chapter 3, it talks about the church. Chapter 4, it talks about the church. And then it's like the church isn't mentioned again. 
So it's like church, 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 church. Then it doesn't talk about it again. But you know what it starts talking about? All the wrath that takes place. It's almost as if in the book of Revelation, if it was a timeline, the church is taken out and then the world continues on in its wrath, which I think is a picture of the rapture. Now, now listen, I know that for some people who may be critics, they would say, well, pastor, that, that's just wishful thinking. That's just escapism. We're going to have to hunker down. We're going to have to prove ourselves. That's just, that's all. listen, here, here's what I would tell you that I don't think escapism and wishful thinking, I don't think it's that, but I also think that that we are given a message of hope. Look, look at this. First Thessalonians four eighteen. therefore comfort one another with these words. How is it comforting to say you're going to be persecuted, you're going to go through famine, and your head might get chopped off? That ain't comforting. So he doesn't say warn each other with these words. He said comfort each other. C.S. Lewis says it this way. He says the continual looking ahead to eternity is not wishful thinking and it's not escapism. It's what Christians are meant to do. We're meant in the worst seasons of life to look ahead and say, it's not always going to be this way. One day there is going to be a reckoning and, and Jesus is going to put all this back together. But I also think the rapture shows God's character. I really do. Ladies, take for example, you know, in scripture, we're told that Jesus is the groom and, 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 and we're his bride as, as the church. Consider ladies, if you were single um, and you met the perfect guy. I mean, he's good looking, he, he got a job, he comes to church, he's in a life group, like all that stuff, okay, perfect. And consider he's about to propose to you, and so he gets down on one knee and says, I love you so much, but I wanna verify your love for me. So here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna take you as my wife, but then I'm gonna turn you over to the most evil man ever for seven years. And he's going to mistreat you and he's going to abuse you. And, and if, if you're not careful, he'll even cut off your head. But don't, don't worry, it's going to be good for you. You're going to have a stronger faith and, and you're going to have a greater appreciation for me. And, and, and then at the end of that seven years, I'm going to come and get you and we can be together forever. Who would want to marry somebody like that? I mean, that's crazy. That is not, that just doesn't, it, it's not the character of God. Look, look at this, First, First Thessalonians 5, 9. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what it's saying. Hey, Jesus didn't come and make us suffer. He came and suffered so we don't have to suffer. The effects of sin and I believe the effects in his second coming. Why would Jesus come and do all that suffering just so we have to go through it too? No, no, no. His nature is to love and protect and to self-sacrifice and to keep and to snatch away. I believe it's comforting because we ain't going through all that mess. Jesus is going to come and pull us to him and we're going to be able to be with him for eternity aside from that. That's my personal belief. Now, now let me say this. Um, I also believe in the rapture for this reason. I, I showed you kind of a biblical approach, but let me tell you a very practical approach. I, don't, I believe in the rapture is not just about the protection of the church. I think it's what is needed to progress God's end times plans. So, so what do you mean, pastor? I'm saying it's not just for the people in the church. I'm saying it's also for the world to continue on the track God's got for it. So we'll, we'll explain. Imagine with me for a second. Um, the total uh, population for the United States is, is over 300 million people. Let's imagine half of them, uh, statistically, somewhere along, about half of them say they're Christians. Now, I, I, don't really, I don't really believe that we're about 50% Christian in this nation. For this reason, um, I don't think the character of our nation looks like people who are following Jesus. And so let, let's, let's cut that in half just for round numbers. Let's say it's 75 million genuine followers of Jesus. Okay, I want you to imagine for a second, 75 million people were immediately pulled out of this earth. Like immediately. And I want you to consider what this country would be like. I mean, think about it. What it would do to the education system, military, police, government, business, agriculture, medical. I mean, we're talking about 75 million people whew, gone. Now I want you to imagine it's not just going to happen in America. It's going to happen in the entire world. So somewhere between one and two billion people gone. I mean, society would crumble. 
Economies would crash. Nationalities would fade. Countries couldn't even keep themselves together. And, and can you imagine how much fear and confusion would be rampant? Now, now imagine this. How easy in those circumstances for a one world government to form. How easy it would be to have to pull together a one world economy. How, how all of a sudden someone who was charismatic, capable, and with a calm and clear voice said, I can lead us through this, and Antichrist would rise and start to lead people in a godless direction. Listen, I, I think the rapture is not just for the church. I think it's the type of cataclysmic event necessary for God's plan to continue rolling for the earth to follow through with his events. Now, take a breath. It's a little intense. <laughs> I, know, I know for some of you, you probably, I mean, if I left you here, I'd be doing you a disservice and the scriptures a disservice because I'd just be living you very anxious. Okay. That's not the way this is supposed to be. It's supposed to be comforting. I remember when I was a kid, um, you know, I grew up in church and we went to Sunday school and we didn't have curriculums like we do today. Like we have a trek for your kids. We, we believe at every age they're learning something appropriate about the character of God and the people. It wasn't like that. When, when I was in Sunday school, it was just whatever the teacher wanted to teach. And the teacher that I happened to have, she was hard. I mean, we're talking about like just mean, to be honest with you. And I remember she coming in with her charts and graphs telling all us kids, Jesus is coming back. Tribulation, you want your head cut off? Then you better get serve him. Like that's the kind of Sunday school I went to, okay? And I remember we just all scared to death that at any point in time, Jesus was coming back. And, um, and I remember one, one night I, we were playing video games, a friend of mine, and, and all of a sudden he, he said, I'm going to run to the other room. He went to the other room. And next thing I know, he's been gone a while. And I'm thinking, he's been gone a while. And I get up and I don't hear anybody in the house. And I start looking around and I can't find anybody. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I've been left. The rapture took place. <laughs> and, and, and then I come in and I find his clothes folded in the floor. Because that's what she told us would happen. I don't know why she believed Jesus taking everybody naked, but that's what she told us would happen. And so I thought, oh my gosh, I've been left and here his clothes. And I, I got all this fear. And, and then it dawned on me though, I said, wait a minute. I pay way more attention in Sunday school than he does. If one of us is going in the rapture, it's me. It's definitely not him. So I, I take his clothes and I run outside and throw them into the neighbor's yard. Listen, now I was scared for a minute, but you should have seen how scared he was having to go naked to get his clothes from the neighbor's yard. All I'm saying is this, fear is the most associated emotion with the end times because our outlook is wrong. That is not what scripture says. You know what, what if I told you the, way, the filter you're supposed to look through the end times according to Jesus is a wedding. It's a wedding. That Jesus says, here how I want you to think about this end times. It's like a wedding. I'll just show it to you, Matthew 25. Jesus is saying, at that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps, these are oil lamps, and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five of them were wise. So of the 10, five, they, they went half and half. Here's why. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. So th they took their phones but they forgot their charger, okay? Um, the wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was long time in coming and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And at midnight, the cry rang out, here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and they trimmed their lamps and the foolish ones said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps have gone out. No, they replied, there may not, may not be enough for both of us and you instead Go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived and the virgins who were ready, everybody say ready. ready. They were ready. They went in with him to the wedding banquet. The wedding started. But to the others, the door was shut. So um, Jesus in this gives us three things to be rapture ready. And I want to give them to you. Uh, here's the first one. He says, you need to be expecting expecting. Um, I love that this series has kind of awakened us as a church. 
Um, we've been in it for a few weeks and, and, and maybe if you're here for the first time, you think, oh my gosh, I, I need to wake up. Like, I love that, that, that many of us are thinking in, in this direction, but I, I don't want us to take it too far. I've had some people say to me, pastor, if Jesus is coming, I guess I don't need to pay these student loans and I'm just going to cash out my retirement. You know, whoa, 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 whoa. Before you run up your credit cards and, and, and you cash out your retirement, let, let me say this. Living with expectancy doesn't mean living without wisdom. Okay. And the, 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 as a believer, we're called to live in a duality of yes, we are here, but yes, Jesus is coming. And we're supposed to give both to, uh, our energies that. And that's why it's so brilliant that Jesus uses a wedding as an example. Have you ever been around a bride in the months leading up to the wedding? I don't know that there's ever been someone more productive than a bride leading up to a wedding. I mean, she's getting all of her work done for this season of life, but she's also getting a ton of work done for the next season of life. Like she, all her priorities and energy, I gotta do, I gotta do this so that I can work on this. And, and, and it's amazing what, what a bride can do as she's fully focused in the moment for something that's coming. And, and, and that's, that's what's amazing. Have you ever seen how much energy and effort and money? I listen, I got four daughters. I know how much money it's gonna cost. To, to, it's just all of this is about something that's not now, but is coming. And that's the way we're supposed to live is, we, yes, we got things to do right now. We're in a season of life where we're, we're living, but there's also a coming season and we have to be prepared for it. And so, so here's what I want you to get is, listen, to live for Christ now means that you live today in light that there is a day coming that everything changes. So, so go ahead, g get married, go to school, come on, pay your bills, uh, uh, buy a house, go on vacation, do those things, but keep one eye on the reality. Jesus could come at any moment. There's no more signs that need to take place. No more, no more working in the world. Jesus could come today if he wanted to, and it would line up with scripture and keep that reality. Let it show that you have priorities that are not just earth, but eternity. That, that, that your investment is not just earth, but also kingdom. That, that, that your actions are not just for now, but also for what makes a difference then. Listen, we're expecting. We have to live like that. Now, the challenge is the second one, we have to be enduring. Now, we don't really get this. This wedding thing doesn't make sense to us the way it's laid out. In the first century, this would have made, this is a first century Jewish wedding. It would have made all the sense in the world. I mean, we don't understand. So there's 10 brides. There's, there's not only the bride's grooms, the man, and there's these 10 brides. And it doesn't seem like there's a start time. Like he's just showing up whenever. And, and so we don't fully get it. Um, let me say it this way. First of all, the reason he's coming is because in the Jewish culture, he went, uh, when he, he got engaged, he went away then to prepare a place for he and his new brides to live together. By the way, in John 14, Jesus told the disciples, he said, I'm leaving right now, but I'm not just leaving. I'm going to prepare a place for everyone. And he says, and I'll return because he's, he's, the, he's the groom. And so, um, but, but because they didn't know when he'd be done, they didn't know when he'd come back. So there was, there was this reality of we know the season, but we don't know the exact moment. So we got to get ready. So they, they got all their hair done and, and, and whatever it took. And, 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 and listen, he could come at 2 p.m. or he could come at 2 a.m. So we need these lamps so that we can walk and be a part of this wedding. Because listen, it don't have a start time. The start time is he shows up, it starts. Okay. And, and I know for us, we, we don't get that. We, we go to a wedding and it's maybe an hour. They went to a wedding. It could have lasted days. Okay. The issue here is, is that they not only have to be ready, they have to stay ready. And that's also the tragedy of this story. The Bible says there are 10 virgins, one bridegroom. The 10 represent the church. The one is Jesus. And in effect, Jesus says, when I show up, half the church will not have stayed ready for my return. Here's what he's saying. When I show up, their fuel or their passion for me will have run low like oil. And that's already happening. The church right now has a very low passion for God's word. The American Bible Society just came out and said they saw an unprecedented drop in the way that Christians use the Bible from 50% to 39% now. Only 39% of Christians are using the Bible. Listen to what they found. Only 10% of professing Christians read the Bible daily. 
Passion's low. Passion's low for the church. Barna found that one in three practicing Christians left the local church after COVID-19 and have not returned and do not intend to return. Hey, 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 it's not just medical anymore. Now it's become cultural. As our schedules have filled back up with ball games and travel and, and work, people are saying, I can follow Christ without the church. But did you notice he's coming back for the church? We've lost our passion for sharing our faith. 70% of unchurched Americans, 70% of people who do not know Jesus say no one has ever told me how to receive the gospel. That means seven out of 10 people you work with, they're saying, I couldn't do it if I wanted to. Nobody's even explained it to me. 95% of Christians have never led another people to Christ, never led another person to Christ. Hey, can I just be honest with you? The oil is very low. And when it comes to passion, let, let me just say this. Your passion is not someone else's problem. It's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. As a matter of fact, um, some of the virgins, they said, hey, give us some of your oil. And what they said is, no, nah, you got to get your own. I, you can't borrow my passion. You can't borrow what my, my fervency. Here's what Romans 12, 11 says. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your, not everybody. We can't keep everybody. You got to keep your spiritual fervor in serving the Lord. Here's the way the message writes it. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. And, and here's what it's referring to. There is nothing addictive about God. Like, like it's, it's not natural. Like there's not anything where it's just going to take over and do it itself. Nobody's ever read the Bible and became addicted to it. No one's ever prayed and just became addicted to prayer. No one's ever said, oh, I got to get to church. I got to get a fix. I got to get a fix. Nobody's ever, there's nothing addictive about your relationship with God because God is a shepherd, not a slave driver. And things that put us in bondage are meant for our despair. He wants a willing, sincere worship. He, he wants people who say, hey, I'm, I'm going to sacrifice how I feel for what I want in you, Jesus. Listen, he, passion is a command, but he's left it in your control. And so if you're sitting here today and, and, and you're listening to this and you find yourself apathetic, kind of low, running low on fuel, you, all, only things, there don't be a prayer line to fix it. There's not a book I can give you that would fix it. You have to decide today that I am going to reprioritize according to showing my passion for Jesus. I decide today to join a life group. Decide today to open your Bible and read it for the first time in a long time. Decide today that after you leave here, this wasn't just checking the box, you're gonna go to the car and say, God, what do you need to do in me? Decide today to open your mouth and worship. Nobody else can be passionate for you. You have to decide, I'm gonna be ready, I'm gonna stay ready, because I am not gonna miss the most important moment in human history, because listen, that door will shut. There's going to be a moment and that door will shut and it's going to be too late to get your passion in. Okay. Now here's the last one. Jesus says, Hey, you need to be excited. This is the one that I think's most off. Um, because for, for, for most people, it's just fear. Listen, if you, if all you care about is six, six, six and heads cutting off and world leaders and timelines and sequence, you're going to feel fear and that you missed the out. You missed it. Listen, this, this is a wedding. It, it means it's not a horror story. It's a love story. Not about wrath. It's about relationship. These brides aren't preoccupied with, well, the caterer is going to be here at this time. And if that caterer appears, that means another caterer appears at this time. They don't care. They're just excited that the one they love is coming. And that's what we see at the end in Re Revelation 21. It says, I saw the holy city in a new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And our hearts were prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And then it says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people. And he will dwell with them. And God will be, his, God will be with his people and God himself will be with them and that he will be their God. Listen, it's a wedding. And really, here's the only basic two facts of the end times you need. Number one, God loves you. It's the only thing he gets out of this whole experiment is you. Like, like, like he got his creation ruined. He gets to watch the impact of sin. 
He gets to see open rebellion. He sees the death of his son. And the only thing he gets out of it is you. That's how much he loves you. And the second fact is this, we will be with him forever. That's what governs our outlook. Uh, last week, Kayla and I celebrated our 15th wedding anniversary. And um, come on, I know she's had to put up with me for 15 years, you know. And her tradition on our wedding anniversary, she likes to get out and look at the wedding photos. I think she likes to remember me when I had hair, you know. I, but um, she, she's looking through them and we were talking. And I remember that day. Oh, I remember there was about 300 people there. I remember who, who was standing where. I remember the food. I remember the feeling. I, I remember all of it. But my strongest memory, my strongest memory is they had this umbrella in front of her as she, because we were outside. They had an umbrella. And when they removed the umbrella, I got to see her. And it was like all the other faces faded. None of that mattered anymore. She had my full focus. Listen, I know there are some of you who think, well, you know, I hope Jesus doesn't return until I have kids. He doesn't return until I get married. Doesn't return until I have grandkids. Doesn't return until, you know, the cards win one more championship. <laughs> Listen to me. When Jesus comes, you will not struggle with any regret. You won't say, hey, I wish I had got one more ball game or one more binge watch. When you see him, everything else will fade. You will see the mouth that spoke you into existence. You will see the eyes that never lost your, your personhood. In your worst moments, he kept his eyes on you. You will see the back that was scarred for your healing, and you will see the hands that were wounded for your salvation. Listen, you, you're going to see the feet that walked out of a grave so that you could be in relationship with God. There's not going to be any hesitation. There's not going to be any regret. There's not going to be any wish. I, w- I wish we could go back and do No, no, no. When you you see him, pure joy will overtake your soul. You will see the one who created you and redeemed you and has kept you and whom you will be with forevermore. And that's all that will matter. The other stuff will fade to black. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say it this way. I meet people sometimes and they're really into end times, really into it. And I'm okay with that. That's fine. But listen, the more you know about the end times, the more expressive your worship should be. Because if you know a lot about Jesus' coming, but your worship is lacking, something's wrong with your focus. People who have the heart of God, people who see it as a wedding, they know he's coming. And it ain't always going to be like this, and it ain't always going to struggle like this, that there will be a day it's all made right, and we don't have to see him through faith. We'll see him, and that should cause your heart to burst every time you get a chance to worship. Come on, I want you to stand to your feet. Hey, what's going on, everybody? I hope you enjoyed this message you just heard. For more information and other content, go ahead and hit that subscribe button and hit that bell icon as well so you can be notified every time we upload something new on our channel. Now, while you're here, go ahead and check out past messages and other videos, and we'll see you next time.